Okay, in this problem, we need to find values for the constants a and b so that this piecewise defined function over here is continuous everywhere. That is to say, it should be continuous over all reals. Well, with that in mind, what can we say about this function in terms of its continuity, even if we don't know the particular values of a and b? Let's take a look at this top piece which is used if x is anywhere left of or on negative 6. Regardless of the individual values of a and b, isn't this a polynomial piece, being quadratic if a is non-zero and constant if a is zero? And we know something about polynomials. They're continuous everywhere. So the only place this piece might have a problem continuity-wise is right on the border between this piece and the next piece. Namely, right at negative 6 we might have a discontinuity, but everywhere left of negative 6 we should be fine. Since x equals negative 6 might be a problem for us, let's make a little note to that effect down here so we don't forget to go back and check what's happening at that particular x value. Okay. So now let's turn our attention to the second piece. This one's a little more complicated than the first, but its analysis ju is just about as quick. Look at the numerator. Here we have a composition of a linear piece, notice that's also a polynomial, inside a radical, a square root, and then of course we're just subtracting two. If the function was just a linear function, it would certainly be continuous everywhere, since that's a polynomial. And by virtue of the fact that x is greater than negative 6 for this piece, and those values of x always produce positive values inside the radical, and the square root function is continuous at all positive uh, values, this whole piece here must represent a continuous function. And of course, subtracting 2 from a continuous function produces another function that is also continuous at least again when x is strictly greater than negative 6. Continuity wise we don't see problems with this piece until we do this division by x plus 3. We're dividing by a polynomial so it doesn't contribute any discontinuities in its own right but if we divide by 0 here we definitely have a domain issue and that causes a continuity issue. So what value of x causes a problem here? Negative 3. And of course that's been purposefully excluded for that very reason. So we'll need to check this value out as well. We'll need to make sure our function is continuous at negative 3. So we make a note of that as well. Finally, looking at the last piece, we notice it's only defined when x equals a single value, namely negative 3. So we just need to make sure that this piece and this piece work together to produce continuity at that particular x value, at x equals negative 3. So it looks like if I can ensure that this function is continuous at these two values of x, then it should be continuous everywhere. Let's consider the first, x equals negative 6. If this function is to be continuous at x equals negative 6, recall what that means. Three things. The limit as x approaches negative 6 of our function must exist. The function itself must exist at this particular x value, and those two values must agree. Alternatively, we can also say it's continuous at negative 6 if the left and right limits as x approaches negative 6 and the function at negative 6 all exist and agree in value. This definition of continuity at a particular x value is particularly useful when we're talking about piecewise defined functions. So let's put this up here for reference and then consider what these three things are. Okay, so writing these three things down and looking at the first one, if we are just left of negative 6, what is our function? Which piece applies to those particular x values? 
Well, if we're left of negative 6, then we're slightly less than that. So it looks like this first piece applies. So I can write that down. Of course, this particular limit is a limit of a polynomial. And we know limits of polynomials can be evaluated just by plugging in the x value that we are approaching. So this should equal 36, right? That's your negative 6 squared, a plus b. Moving on to the second item here, f of negative 6. Again, which piece applies? Which one handles the case where x equals negative 6? Well, notice the equality option there. So again, it is the first piece, and we can simply plug in negative 6 for x to again arrive at a times negative 6 squared plus b, or 36a plus b. So far, things are looking pretty good, right? We want all three of these things to um, exist and agree in value, and these two certainly exist and agree in value. What about the third one? If we're approaching negative 6 from the right, which piece applies? Well, if we're coming in from the right-hand side, we're slightly larger than negative 6, and so this piece would apply right here. So let's go ahead and replace f of x with its equivalent expression for these x values. Okay, so now how do we evaluate this limit? Well, notice we have a limit of a quotient here. It'd be great if I could rewrite this as a quotient of limits. Of course, I can only do that if the limiting value of the denominator is non-zero as x approaches negative 6 from the right. But notice, of course, that's the case. This is a polynomial piece. To find its limiting value, I can simply plug in negative 6, and I get negative 3 here as a limiting value. And of course, the top can be handled similarly. We had already uh, ascertained that this top piece was continuous. So finding its limiting value as x approaches negative 6 should also be easy. We can, again, just plug in negative 6. Upon doing so and simplifying just a wee bit, we find the limiting value as x approaches negative 6 from the right is 1 third. So this value and this value and this value must all agree if we are to be continuous at negative 6. Notice that doesn't tell us what the values of a and b are. It merely tells us that 36a plus b has to equal 1 third. But that's okay. That's more information than we had before about a and b. In particular, that's one equation in two variables, a and b. If I could find a second equation in those same variables, maybe I would have a system of equations and I could solve for a and b. So maybe that's our overall strategy. Of course, this piece of information, this equation, came from looking at what happens when x equals negative 6. Maybe we can get another equation from looking at what happens when x equals negative 3. Now here again, if we're going to be continuous at x equals negative 3, or continuous everywhere, remember, we hope, then these three things, when c is negative 3, have to all exist and agree in value. And so we look at these three things. And again, taking this one first, what is f doing when x is approaching negative 3 from the left? Which of these three pieces applies? Well, if we're just left of negative 3, wouldn't this piece here apply? And so we can replace f of x with this expression right here. So let's do that. Now, we'd love to evaluate that limit. Of course, we can only break it up into a quotient of limits if the denominator in the limit, as x approaches negative 3, does not go to 0. Unfortunately, that's not the case, right? This is a polynomial piece. To find its limiting value, we can simply plug in negative 3, and of course, negative 3 plus 3 is 0. So we'll have to find another way. Now, we've seen some tricks involving radicals here and evaluating limits one of which is when you see a sum or a difference uh, involving a radical in the numerator like this, we might try multiplying the numerator by this conjugate-like piece. Namely, if this is a minus b, then I want to multiply by a plus b. 
Of course, I don't want to alter this expression by multiplying by something strange here, so I'm going to multiply by a well-chosen value of 1. I'm going to put this over top of itself. Now, when we do that, we can combine these top two factors, recognizing that they're really just a difference of squares. And it looks like we're going to need the room here for the next couple calculations, so let me go ahead and erase these. We'll bring them back in a minute. We still have a limit as x is approaching negative 3 from the left. The top we said combines like a difference of squares, so we have the first guy squared, or 7 plus x, minus the second guy squared, or 4, over our x plus 3 is still there, and then we still have this piece. Now notice, I'm not going to combine these two things. I'm not going to foil them out because I'm hoping that this factor of x plus 3, which is causing a 0 in my denominator and making it more difficult to evaluate this limit as a result, I'm hoping this x plus 3 goes away. I'm hoping it will cancel off. And I can only cancel off a factor if I can see the factor. So I'm going to leave this denominator in factored form. Okay. Of course, looking at the numerator, we can simplify things a bit. Of course, 7 minus 4 is uh, 3 there, so we have an x plus 3. And lo and behold, sure enough, this does cancel off. And now, when I see this limit of a quotient, namely 1 over this mess here, I notice the limiting value of the denominator as x approaches negative 3 is no longer 0. And so I can express this as a quotient of limits, both of which can be found simply by plugging negative 3 in. The top, of course, is just 1, so there's nothing to plug in there. And the bottom, of, of course, is square root of 7 minus 3, or 4. Taking the square root, that's 2. So 2 plus 2, or 1 fourth, when we're all said and done. OK, so let's remember where we are. That was the limit as x approaches our c value in question from the left. That's one of our three things. We need to find the other two as well. So let's clean up our work here a little bit. Let me just focus on this, since I have a limited amount of space here in this screen. OK, so we put the value there. And then don't forget, we need to calculate what is f of negative 3 still. And we also need to find what is the limit as x approaches negative 3 from the right of f of x still. Looking at this one, which piece applies? when x equals negative 3? Well, that's handled explicitly here, right? We should get out simply negative b. And jumping down to this last one, what happens here uh, in f as x approaches negative 3 from the right? Which piece applies? Well, again, it's not equal to negative 3. We're just to the right of negative 3, so it looks like this piece applies again. Of course, if we write the corresponding limit here, notice this is going to be in no way different than the one we did up here. In fact, the calculation we had written previously came up with the general limit. The limit as x approaches negative 3, not just from the right or from the left, but from both directions. So here we can say this again is going to be 1 fourth. Now, if our function is going to be continuous everywhere, it needs to be continuous at negative 3, and that means those three values have to exist and agree. They certainly exist. In order for them to agree, what must B be? Does it make sense that if those two things must be equal, then B must be negative 1 fourth? Hopefully it does. Maybe we can write that over here just to organize our work. There's our second equation. So we should be able to combine these two things together now to find both the values of a and b. Of course, b is easy, right? This is a, a very simple equation. It's the value of b. I can then plug this in right here to find the value of a. Doing that, we see we have this, taking it to the other side. We have 36a equals 1 third plus 1 fourth. 
Of course, that's 4 twelfths plus 3 twelfths, so it looks like we have 7 twelfths here. And then dividing both sides by 36, we have A equals 7 divided by 12 times 36, and of course 12 times 36, let's see, 36 is 12 times 3, 12 times 12 would be 144, and 144 times 3 is 432. So A is 7 over 432. That's it. We have found the values of A and B so that this function is continuous everywhere. That's it.